Good evening, everyone. What better way to spend a snow day than to be with our Lord in his presence? Let's just begin first in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I ask you to open up our hearts this night. Happy to ask you to pour out an abundance of your Spirit upon us. Draw us deeper to your sacred heart. I ask you to bless my words and may all that is said today, tonight, just lift our hearts to you. May it be your grace and your Holy Spirit guiding us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> this evening, we're soon to be approaching Lent, just on Wednesday, and my hope for this talk is to kind of prepare us to enter into the desert with Jesus, to enter deeper into prayer. My hope also is to uncover what prayer is, what is prayer? What is the silent action, the silent reception that you and I have been going through in, this, in these moments? So to frame our minds first for Lent, I want to take our minds away from a moment, away from the snow and the cold, to uh, an island off the Mediterranean Sea, Mount Athos. Mount Athos, it's been around for about a thousand years. And on that island live Greek Orthodox monks. There's about around 2,000 of them. And they live secluded and they have their own little um, towns, their hermitages, their communities. All their work is upon this island. And one of the monks, he reflects that winter is a time for recollection. It is a quiet time when there are no pilgrims coming to Mount Athos. The monk can retreat into his cell. He can focus more on reading and prayer. Winter then is a perfect time for Lent. It slows us down. It brings us indoors. And that might be actually hard for us right now to be indoors, to be at home, because we've gone through a lot of being indoors, especially with the quarantine, the lockdown, everything that's been going on. But if we can take this time during Lent, be a little bit more intentional with what our time indoors can be about. I think we'll reap more fruit. To dive deeper into prayer and to understand a little bit more of that mystery of prayer. So during this time of Lent, during this time of winter, when we're indoors and the heat is cranked up, we have a cup of hot tea or hot coffee or whatever hot liquid you need. Perhaps next to you is your sacred scripture, your rosary, but most importantly, the presence of the Holy Trinity is silently abiding in you. That's where all this begins tonight. The presence of the Holy Trinity silently abiding in you. It's probably one of the greatest mysteries of our faith. And it was said by a priest up at Mundelein some years ago in a homily. He said the most difficult thing for us to believe in is not the miracle of Jesus turning through his priests simple bread and simple wine into his very flesh and blood. No, the more difficult and harder thing for us to grasp, to come to see, is that the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, abide in every baptized soul. There is a greater mystery. As we prayed, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God doesn't only just want to wrap us around, but to be within us, an all-encompassing presence with us. That is where prayer begins, because prayer is communion with God. Prayer is communion with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And to unpack that tonight, I want to use this image of a Nickelodeon. Not the, the TV show or TV commercial Nickelodeon, but the old school Nickelodeon. The, a Nickelodeon, if you recall, is like a large armoire, a huge piece of furniture. 
and on the base of it is a piano that plays if you put in a nickel, just a nickel. And you would hear live music, piano playing, organs, violins, strings, perhaps even trumpets. And it's such a delight to hear that. But you wonder what's going on inside. How is this possible? Well, you can open up a Nickelodeon like you would a cabinet or the side panels and kind of expand to even. And you would see inside all the intricate mechanisms at work, the violin strings playing, the pipes, the trumpets, everything perfectly timed and synchronized. A wonder of mankind constructing and making something. And the interior reality is so much more complicated, is so much more rich to view, to look at, to ooh and ah over. Because when the Nickelodeon's covered up, that reality is hidden, but the music is still playing, it's wonderful. That's what I hope this, this talk, this little reflection, simple as it is, can be for us. When we come to prayer, when we hear, I should pray more, or that desire to pray more, what does it look like on the inside to open up the Nickelodeon, to open up our soul communing with God? It's been a, a desire of mine to kind of tap into that a little bit more and more. Ever since back in college where I found only took one time to kind of hook me into it, but I found such peace, such love being poured into my heart during prayer. It's why all of you came out tonight to weather the storm, to be in our Lord's presence, to pray, to pray. So to go on this journey of unpacking what prayer is, if we begin with the glory be, as our structure. We're going to unpack so much of the wonder of prayer. So the glory be a very simple, humble prayer, but there's so much going on inside. The first part, glory to you, glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Know that prayer first begins with God's desire to commune with us. The second part, as it was in the beginning, let's go there. As it was in the beginning. Our Lord uses that often in Scripture to remind the Pharisees or to remind anyone listening to Him that what He has come to do for us is to restore, to redeem, to gain back what was lost, but what was in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, take your minds now back to another tropical, beautiful place. We hear of Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, walking with God through the garden, in communion with each other. There's the beginning of prayer. There's the beginning of what it was like to walk side by side, the Holy Trinity, in such leisure, in such ease and calm. It is so refreshing to think about. There's an image of prayer as it was in the beginning. So as it was in the beginning, as we were made, our human nature, it needs to commune with God. It needs to be in communion with the divine nature to really feel our fulfillment, to really feel loved at our deepest parts, our most intimate self. And remember, this was God's desire from the beginning. It was he who decided to create, to make us, so that he could share his life with us too as it was in the beginning. Here's a little reflection from the Church Fathers at the Vatican Council, the second one. They wrote in Gaudium et Spes, Joy and Hope. They wrote, The dignity of man rests above all on the fact that he is called to communion with God. Our very dignity can be regained, reshaped, reformed, and strengthened when we come to prayer, when we draw into that communion with God. It is an invitation to converse with God and is addressed to every person as soon as they come into being. That is a great line. As soon as you and I came into being, into existence, in God's plan, he wanted to converse with you. 
He wanted to be in communion with you. There's the joy of baptizing infants and babies. In the very beginning, as it was in the beginning, God always wanted to commune with you, to be in your presence even. This communion with God, it is an exchange of love. That is what all communion truly is based upon. From our co-workers, a little simple degree of love there, friendship, a little greater degree of love, our spouses, an even more intense degree of love. The communion with God is the greatest communion of love. And we read in the Catechism that if prayer is communion with God, if God is the first one to initiate this, And it is such a wonder to consider what prayer is. This is what the Catechism writes. The wonder of prayer is Christ comes to meet every human being. Isn't that evocative of how God the Father sent the Son? The beginnings of the Paschal mystery, the beginning of our salvation. It happens again in prayer. Every time we pray, Christ comes to meet every human being. It is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Jesus thirsts. It's a longing. Can you imagine the last time you were thirsty? It's an ache. If I can't get that glass of water, my mouth is going to be on fire, and I'm just, I'm irritated until I can have it. Christ is in that same agony until he can be in your presence, until he can commune with you in prayer. His asking arises from the depths, the depths of God's desire for us. What a beautiful image to consider the infinity of God who's always been, is now, and will be forever the depths of that. From the depths of that, God is desiring you. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. I love the honesty of the catechism. Whether we realize it or not, Let's be honest, brothers and sisters, that even for myself, too, there are moments on that Monday morning where prayer is just dull. I feel dull. I feel numb. The cup of coffee hasn't worked yet. Whether we realize it or not, that's what is happening inside of us. This is communing with the Holy Trinity. It is encounter with God. Christ thirsting, Christ coming to encounter you. He's knocking on the heart of your door, the door of your heart. Let me be with you. Let me sit in your presence. Let me hear what's on your heart. Let me share with you what's on my heart. That is God's thirst for us. That's deep sharing of ourselves. Jesus has almost put upon himself this necessary longing for you and for me. When we come to our simple and humble moments of prayer, If I may turn to another inspirational person of, of prayer is Erasmus Maricacus. It's a Trappist monk. He writes, Where is the place in man by which an external reality can penetrate him and invade his whole being? Boy, that's a huge line. The external reality. God all of his infinity, all of his magnitude and goodness created the world. An external reality, God is. But it wants to come into our being. It wants to fill us with his very self. Where is this center where man opens up? The point of convergence when the happy meeting of intelligence, will, and emotions can occur where all the pulsations and fibers of a human life coalesce. This central and privileged place in our being can only be the heart. It can only be the heart. We see this also in Scripture. We see this in Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. There we hear, for the first time, Jesus saying, I thirst. I thirst to be in communion with you. I thirst to dialogue with you. 
The Samaritan woman is so thrown off. What, is, what are you, is it that you are asking of me? Jesus says, I want to know your heart. Because there's something on your heart that I want to be a part of. I want to restore. And Jesus so sweetly and gently speaks the truth of her heart. Something that maybe she herself has closed away. that She doesn't want others to know about. He says, you've been married five times. But the one you are with now is not truly your husband. What does she feel in that moment when the truth about her life is so exposed, so vulnerable, the part of her heart that she has kept hidden? She just wants to go throughout her day. She just wants to get the water at the well and go back. She doesn't want to go through this. But to commune with God is to let every part of your heart, every pulsation and every fiber, all the emotions of our heart, to let that be heard, to let that be received. This is what beautifully Jesus does in that conversation. She gives her a sense of freedom. I know what you've gone through. I'm in agony too that you've had to suffer that way. I want to pour out to you eternal life, life life-giving water into your heart. So that you can be filled and restored again in that love. That love that you couldn't find in any of your relationships. That love that you hoped for as a little girl to find in marriage. That dream was scattered for you. And I've come to fulfill that dream in your heart. Beautifully, the conversation moves into worship. Considering that she can't go to the temple, she can't pray to God in his presence, the holy temple. And that's where Jesus really, truly reveals who he is. I'm the Messiah. Perhaps for her, she always wanted to go and to be in communion with God, to worship, but she felt ostracized because of her past. But now, but now all of that has changed. Because our desire to worship, our desire to be in communion with God fulfills that thirst in our hearts to be loved, to be heard, to have our heart exposed and yet still embraced. Beautifully in prayer, this is what happens now. In the beginning, there's the walking in the garden, but now, now is the time where we can expose our hearts, those motivations, those things about ourselves that we can't always articulate, things of our intelligence, our will, and our emotions. And if prayer is truly communion, if I share that with Jesus, Jesus in turn is going gonna, is gonna to share what's on his sacred heart. He's going to share what's on his mind for you, his will for you, his emotions, every pulsation And the inner life of the Trinity wants to be shared with you. Every fiber of his being. This deep, deep sense of communion. But to go deeper, to go deeper into the Nickelodeon of our soul and to see all the more what is turning in that place. Silently, hidden before us. We read again in the Catechism, The heart is the dwelling place where I am, where I live. It's the biblical expression. From the Greeks, we kind of talk more about soul, God entering into the soul. But for our Jewish brothers and sisters, it's the heart. That is where we feel. That is where I withdraw. Sometimes we can get ourselves so caught up in our minds, what's that conversation going on? But to go into silence to go into prayer, and we have that thousand-yard stare. We're withdrawing into our heart. That's where God wants to meet us. The heart is our hidden center, Catechism says. is beyond the grasp of reason and of others. Isn't that a beautiful line? You and I are the deepest part of our personhood. Who you and I are is beyond reason. Not that it's crazy, 
but it's sometimes beyond our articulation. Sometimes we just can't put into words what I'm feeling, what I'm motivated by, or what's going on in me. And sometimes it's beyond others, even with your most intimate spouse. And that just speaks to the great dignity of who you and I are. Because we are this great mystery. We are this great creation from God. Catechism says, only the Spirit of God can fathom the human heart and know it fully. There is a beautiful line. Only the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, only God can fathom all that you are, even if you can't speak it. Does not, we read in scriptures, that the Spirit discerns our every groaning and moan. We need that communion with God. We need to be in communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be heard, felt, loved, and accepted, and understood in every moment. The heart is the place also of decision. Deeper than our psychic drives is the place of truth where we choose life or death. Sometimes there's just an impulse within us. Sometimes our appetites are, are more than who we are. All of what's going on in us. St. John Paul II has this beautiful line that we are not the sum of our sin. We're not the sum of our appetites or our impulses. We are the sum total of God's love for us. And to enter into prayer is to tap into that reality and to receive from God, to draw from that living water, from the well of his being, that eternal life. Lastly, it is the place of encounter, because as the image of God, we live in relationship. We were made in the image and likeness of God. Our soul was made for this very purpose of prayer, to be in communion with the Holy Trinity, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. That's our last part, as it will be forever. Because in our heart, in our prayer, in that silence, is the place of covenant. The place of covenant. Covenant, we can also think of it as matrimony, that union, that forge of a bond out of love. It's the place of covenant with God. And we are in the new covenant, the everlasting covenant. So prayer, the catechism goes on to say, prayer then is the living relationship in this new covenant, the everlasting covenant, why Christ came, so that what was lost in the beginning, that communion, can now be forever, unending communion with Jesus. It's the grace of the kingdom of heaven. See, the kingdom of heaven is the Holy Trinity. It's God's dwelling. And what we received at baptism is the kingdom of heaven within us, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We enter into union with the entire holy and royal Trinity. That is the everlasting covenant that it takes place within our hearts when we pray. And beautifully, when we do pray, the glory be. Traditionally, you see that when we pray that we bow, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. We bow to reverence to God, but if I can take that imagery a step further and say we bow, focusing on our heart, that that's where God is too. Every time we bow, we recognize the holy and royal trinity is within us. The new covenant, communion as God desired in the beginning is now will be forever, is that the Holy Trinity can be in union with the whole human spirit. Thus the life of prayer, the life of prayer, our Monday morning prayer, our prayer right now, when we turn to the rosary, when at night, when we don't feel like any big words are coming, but Lord be with me tonight, or if at the end of the day I just sigh, and that's my prayer, whatever our life of prayer is, 
the Catechism says, is the habit of being in the presence of the thrice holy God and communion with him. This communion of life is always possible. It's always possible. And if our life of prayer is developing a habit of prayer, a habit of being in the presence of God, then what we start now will be forever in heaven, forever fulfilled. As we build our relationship with Jesus in prayer, sharing our hearts with him and him sharing his heart with us, diving deeper into the mystery of who he is and who we are, that is just carried out forever in heaven. That foreverness of the covenant of that communion as God so desired. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. I want to share with you one last little tidbit, one last little mechanism within the Nickelodeon of our soul, the intricacies of prayer. To go back to that structure of the glory be. It's curious in Hebrew. The way that their language constructs verbs is that to convey the past, the verb is complete. The action is done. But the verb tense for future and present is one and the same. It's incomplete. It's ongoing. So to pray as it was in the beginning, that's completed. The old desire for communion and the old covenant in the garden is completed. But what is now? What is now is uncompleted. What is now will go on forever into eternity. The new establishment of communion with God through prayer. So brothers and sisters, all of that is but a humble, meager glimpse into what goes on in your soul during prayer, what goes on in your heart in prayer. We may not feel it, we may not see it, but we hear the music of the Nickelodeon of our prayer always. That's why we're always drawn again and again to come to prayer. But know that within your soul, within that silence, is this great, unfathomable mystery of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit communing with you, sharing our lives together. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.